I'm, I'm a behind the scenes kind of a, and more of an idea guy, so I'm going to throw out some ideas this afternoon. Uh, what, what I'm calling this is the door to conservatism. Uh, and so I'm going to start off, I'm going to read, read some of this and then I'll, I'll, knowing myself, I'll ad lib some as well. Uh, fellow conservatives, libertarians, and ICANs. Now, I think Danny knows what that means, John Robson knows what that means. I believe that conservatism has a branding problem, so I sometimes refer to us as ICANs, or that's informed citizens against nanny statism. We need to take back some words like tolerance and even progressive, and we need a few words of our own, so ICANs is one of them, and, it, and it, the, the acronym kind of fits. Anyway, I also believe that a majority of those that call themselves liberal are in fact what I call undiscovered conservatives. When exposed to reality, they often become ICANs. But how do we expose these so-called liberals to reality? And that's, that's basically what I want to talk about. The left, or those that I call the nanny statists, control most of the institutions of education, and through them, they educate the influencers in media, in entertainment, and to a great extent, in the political arena. And of course, our universities produce the next generation of educators who will continue indoctrinating students with a message that big government is good, and those conservatives are nasty folk who care about no one but themselves. As a result, too many people see that see that see that as a conservative brand and reject us out of hand but rebranding can be accomplished with exposure and information when i began setting up let's do it ourselves and i i, I should i'll insert in here where that name came from i was reading mark stein's book after America Armageddon about, well, in the fall of 2011, and I came across an anecdote that he tells about the little community he lives in in New Hampshire. Uh, he lives up a mountain road, a few miles from town, a few houses on it, a few bridges, what we would call acreages out here. And one of the, one of the bridges went out, was condemned by the highways department, and the highways department, uh, New Hampshire highways department, was gonna help the, the uh, county fix the bridge, but they didn't have money in the budget. The cost was going to be $200,000. The state was going to pay two-thirds. The county would pay one-third, about $65,000. So that was going to be their bill. So the, they put in a temporary bridge. Five years later, the temporary uh, bridge was worn out. Uh, still no money in the state budget, and somebody got the idea, well, the feds have uh, a program for this kind of thing. Let's see what they can do. So the feds got involved. The price went up to $600,000. They were going to pay half, and then the county and the state each quarter. So the county's cost had gone from sixty-five thousand now up to over one hundred and fifty thousand. Mark Stein had a friend that was on the community council, and at the meeting when this was presented, he kind of lost his temper. He said, "Screw the state. Let's do it ourselves." And when I read that, "Let's do it ourselves," I thought, "This is you know, this is my family history. My background is Mennonites moving from Switzerland." in 1739 and, and pioneering way out 100 miles west of Philadelphia and doing this sort of thing. So that just really appealed to me. Anyway, the end of that of Mark's story is that the county did it themselves for $30,000, less than half of what it would have cost them with the state help and a fifth of what it would have cost them with the federal government help. There's a, there's a lesson here. We got the lesson in the floods in uh, Calgary in 2013 in High River, like it goes on and on, and yet we still say, well, there should be a government program. Anyway, that's where the name Let's Do It Ourselves came from. And when I saw that, I thought, this is, I've got to organize something around this idea. So when I began setting up Let's Do It Ourselves, I hired Cindy to assist with social media and to sort and scan the stacks of research clippings that I'd accumulated. Cindy was university educated, and for a while, had been somewhat involved in politics, but she's now in her 50s and she'd become disengaged. She still considered herself a liberal, and I think she was a bit apprehensive about working with a guy like me who was passionately for less government, more self-reliance. But within a couple of weeks of coming to work for me, 
and having access to relevant articles and doing research, Cindy realized that she was more of a conservative than a liberal, and she admitted as much. So I asked her what had been her mental image of the conservative brand. Well, she said, I saw them in old, as old white guys. Well, okay. Christian fundamentalists who hated gays and immigrants and had no time or money for helping anyone other than themselves and their immediate circle. And that was the image that most of her friends had as well. But after being with me for a couple of weeks and doing some research, Cindy's, uh, Cindy's uh, apprehension of conservatism had been rebranded. Her sp perspective was changed by exposure and information. And she realized she really was a conservative and rapidly became an ICANN, an informed citizen against nanny statism. At last year's Manning Conference in Ottawa, once again Mark Stein, made the comment that culture trumps politics, and until we begin to do the hard work of changing the culture, our political success will be limited and sporadic. And Milton Friedman made the same case that it isn't necessary to get the right politicians into office, what is necessary is to make it politically profitable for a politician to vote the way you want them to. And I've got the link here if anybody's interested in looking. It's, a, it's a, about a 38 second clip and he just completely demolishes the idea that we have to get the right politicians into office. We have to place the politicians in the right culture and then I don't care what party they are, they'll do the right thing. You know, unless they're a really principled NDP or something like that. So stating the problem is, is simple. We need to convert more undiscovered conservatives like Cindy into ICANs. That will create the right culture and translate into encouraging our politicians, almost any politician, to do the right thing. The topic for this conference is what is needed for essential freedoms to thrive? Well, to be repetitive, the right culture. But the challenge is that we're a far distance from living in that right culture. So where do we find all those Cindy's that we need? That's a big problem. Anybody here ever watch Sean Hannity? A few of you? Let me say this. Let not your hearts be troubled. We can do this. We can change the culture. But first, we have to stop the insanity. That is, we have to stop doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that in the future we don't have to do politics, nor am I suggesting that we stop conducting research and writing articles and doing interviews and organizing seminars like this one. But in, in addition to our time spent teaching the choir, because that's what we are, let's face it, we're already we don't need conversion, nobody in here needs conversion. And trying to get them out to practice, which as Danny knows is difficult to do, we have to get serious about growing the choir. And I am suggesting that the big impediment to growing the conservative choir is that we do not provide an open and welcoming doorway to conservatism. Until we fix that, we cannot fix the insanity problem. All our researching and writing and politicking must continue unabated but we shouldn't expect different results. Think of it this way. We have to keep preaching and practicing and politicking on the second and third and floor, fourth floors of this, let's say this building, but we're, we're seemingly oblivious to the fact that there's no, no ground floor and no doorway. We, we sometimes get academic, we get you know, this is the conservative infrastructure. We're all up, up here at various levels of conservatism. But how do we get people into this movement? And that's what we have to, have to really take a look at. Last, so I'm going to give you some examples. Last fall, the Alberta government amounced, amount, announced the Springbank Dry Dam, a flood mitigation project to be constructed just west of Calgary. And for those of you from out of town, it's out west of the city, and it's going to take uh, several thousand acres of ranchers' lands and the landowners who will lose the use of their land heard about it on the radio or read about it in the papers, which is against the law. This is a blatant example of property rights being bulldozed. There have been new, numerous articles and television segments about the issue, but how do we communicate the concept of property rights to those undiscovered conservatives 
most of whom read neither the newspapers nor magazines, nor watch or listen to the news. And here's where it gets personal. I talked to our grandchild number seven, we have eight, age 13. Carter is interested in his smartphone, skateboarding, and hockey. When I asked him how he felt about property rights, he replied exactly as I expected, I have no clue what you're talking about. And you'd get the same thing from a lot of adults, unfortunately. So I said, show me your smartphone. Actually, I was gonna pull mine out, but mine's back on the table. But I said to him, show me your smartphone. I said, is that your property? Of course it was. I said, how would you feel if TELUS sent you a note saying that, although you own the phone, they would no longer provide service? And I explained to him that for the purposes of our discussion, TELUS was the only service provider. So his phone would be useless. He looked at me and again replied exactly as I expected, and this is verbatim, that would suck. I said, that's what I mean by property rights. Whether someone actually takes away your property or just takes away your ability to use it, they've taken your property. He got it immediately. I believe that simple conversation so firmly embedded the concept of property rights in Carter's brain that 50 years from now he'll still remember it. By relating property rights issues to something that was really important to him, I provided a doorway on the first floor of conservatism. He walked in and had a lesson in becoming an I can, an informed citizen against nanny statism. So what, what, we, intend to, what we intend to do at Let's Do It Ourselves is to re-interview Carter and the digitize, the word I made up this week, that conversation and put it on YouTube and other social media. I expect he'll tell all his friends at school about it. That's how we spread the message. In the summer of 2013, I was at a grocery checkout and I noticed a young mom behind me with two children and a cartload of groceries, including two four liter jugs of milk. So I waited and when she came out the door, I said, would it be okay if I asked you a couple of questions? I noticed you, that you have eight liters of milk in your cart. How do you feel about supply management? Exactly as I expected, she replied she had no idea what I was talking about. So I proceeded to explain what it meant and how it was costing her family, at the very least, a family season pass to our local outdoor amusement center, Callaway Park, plus a family season to our world-class heritage park, plus a family season pass to the Calgary Zoo. She was shocked and said, what can I do about it? That's a good question, and if we're serious, it's one we should answer, because there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Canadians just like her and like my grandson Carter, and like Cindy. So, what we're going to do is vidigitize conversations like that one, and we're going to vidigitize Mark Milkey's insights and graphs, and we're gonna take John Robson's lectures, re-record them at half speed, <laughs> so we can hear them, <laughs> so that we can, figure it all out, break them into topical segments, digitize them, and get them into circulation. Conservatism is based on the reality of the human condition, and we have incredibly gifted spokespersons to explain that fact. And if we do it, it will work, because when I suggested to that young mother what we would do, that we would do exactly what I'm talking about, enable her to become informed by producing brief educational videos, on topics like supply management that affected her directly and send them to her on her smartphone, her eyes lit up and she said, that would work. If you get enough mums involved, I will tell you, we'll change the culture. So what else do we need to do? Well, we have to place more emphasis on working together, and I've talked to some people about this today. We criticize government waste and bureaucratic duplication, and yet we must acknowledge that there's way too much overlap and duplication of effort in the conservative movement. We need to share resources, and I'm talking about all kinds of resources. And I can tell you this, having had a conversation with uh, Brian uh, Lilly this morning, other organizations like Rebel Communications are going to be doing some things that are similar to some of the things that Let's Do It Ourselves will do. 
We intend to work with them and to share any resources that we have that will enable them to be more effective because ultimately that will make us more effective. This is not a zero-sum game and yet I have run into organizations, I'm sorry to say, that, that take that attitude. There's, there's shoot, uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation has been in business for 40 years. They've got 80,000 members. I said to, oh, what's his name? Uh, Derek Fildebrand. Fildebrand. Derek Fildebrand. I said there's 20 million taxpayers in Canada. How about a million members in the next five years? You know, I mean, there's lots there for, for all of us. We need to work together. And Danny's heard this from me over and over again. One of my biggest frustrations is that conservative research and ideas and this, what goes on at places like this, currently reach far too limited an, o an audience. In Canada, conservatives should be working towards getting our message to hundreds of thousands. In the United States, tens of millions, and around the world, billions. We need to understand that like capital, ideas know no borders. The nanny status certainly understand that. And it, it, as a, an example, and some of you remember that back in the, in the 70s, we had an influx of union organizers from Great Britain. One was named Bob White, involved with the post office. We had strike after strike after strike. I mean, they've certainly brought the, the left, the, the nanny state ideas have come here from Europe. We need to take that global view that this is a borderless discussion. But now, to the main focus of Let's Do It Ourselves, it's to create a virtual community online. One with, and, and I'm talking about a virtual online community, with all the services its citizens need to become informed, educated, and involved. To know they are in, and, to, and that they belong, and that they can make a difference. And we will give them all the tools that they need that. On a visit to Phoenix, I shared my vision with a group of very discouraged Republicans. I spoke with them several of them I spoke with several of them after I finished and one of them, Margie Kellum, said to me almost with tears in, our, in her eyes, "You've given me hope." I said to her, "We can do this, Margie, and I'm telling you here today, we can do this. We can do this Alberta, we can do this Canada, we can do this America." We can do this Britain and Australia and New Zealand and India. We can take back the culture. And as we do that, we will automatically see that renewal of freedom that we're looking for. Thank you.